things, but um, no, because there's always something new to learn. And so no, I haven't gotten bored. I've also, I've worked at a lot of different, different national parks, so I haven't been here for my whole career either. Um, so you go from talking about caves to, you know, Freedom's colonies to. And I suppose people ask colonies. different questions and you, so you take different tangents. Well, Chris, if you want, we can get right into some of it after 11. Sure, um, yeah. If there are any uh, questions from the audience, we would ask that you repeat them before you answer them so our Zoomers can hear you. And then if Tricia has any questions, um, we'll ask them that, to put them in the chat box. Sure, that works. Give those to you at the end. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Thank you all again for coming. I'm going to let Josh take it. Y'all have been talking to him for a little bit, too. So. <laughs> yeah, well, good morning. Good morning. My, good morning. my name is Josh. Um, ranger at Fort Raleigh National Historic Site. And um, I guess, you know, I wanted to start this morning by just coming out and saying, I know that Fort Raleigh has an identity crisis. Because what does Fort Raleigh mean? Has anybody, just show of hands in the room, has anybody heard of Fort Raleigh before? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. Okay, a lot of you are local, maybe not super local. But, um, <coughs> What does Fort Raleigh mean? What is the story that we tell at that site? Lost colony. Okay, that's one of that's one of the stories. The point is that that Fort Raleigh doesn't really do, do a great job of fully incorporating what the site's history is. Originally, when Fort Raleigh is established back in in 1941, the sole purpose of it, established by Congress, is to to talk about the first attempted English settlement in North America, because at least part of that settlement is located on the grounds of Fort Raleigh. Through the years though, that has evolved, that's changed, and by 1990, Congress actually reauthorized the purpose of the park to tell that story, but also to incorporate the Native American history of the Roanoke and other tribes that have been in that area for over a thousand years. The Freedmen's Colony story of, of the formerly enslaved who were escaping to Roanoke Island and building a community there story that we're going to talk about today. And so there's a, a much greater history. There's even there's this little known story of Reginald Fessenden, who does a radio experiment there in 1902. It's between Cape Hatteras and Fort Raleigh, or where Fort Raleigh sits today. And he's the, it's the first time that there's a real clear wireless voice transmission. Mm -hmm. And so a little known part of, of the park's history. And so there's a lot of different layers to Fort Raleigh. But the one that I really want to go into today is one that, to be honest with you, we know some, but we don't know all about it. This is a story that we are learning, honestly, almost as we speak. I can almost guarantee you that there's somebody back at the park right now doing research on this topic. And just yesterday, I was at the park and got new information shared to me by a really passionate volunteer that we have who's been really helping dive deep into a lot of archive records and find stories of people that were a part of this community. And so some of the things that I have with me today are, are accounts that I've only read myself once or twice and are accounts that you won't find in these books. Now, these books are, are fantastic um, introductions and, and histories of the Freedmen's Colony. They, they aren't the complete story, but that's because a lot of the information wasn't known or wasn't connected when they were written. And so they're a very good foundation upon which to, to grow. And to be honest with you, I think that right now, Fort Raleigh is in the early stages of understanding the full history of this story. I think that there's more information out there that we will learn about and that we'll be able to discover in the coming months or weeks or, I don't know, maybe years. Um, I wanted to, to give you a, a general overview of the Freedmen's Colony today. I wanted to give you some of the information that we've recently discovered and, and try to mix those things together. This isn't a presentation that I've given regularly. We, we do talk about the Freedmen's Colony, but a lot of this is, is really new info. And then I wanted to, to share a little bit about the, the ongoing project we have happening at, at the park now to better share this history, something that I'm fairly excited about, so I'd like to, to spread that around. I, I think to start this history, though, I want to go actually to Cape Hatteras. I want to bring you back to the year 1861. It's the first time that there's a Union presence in, North, in this part of North Carolina. It's when, when the, the Union forces capture Hatteras itself. Okay. 
1861. At that point, the Union Army has like a, a foothold. It's part of their overall strategy to blockade southern ports. But as I think a lot of you will know, the, um, the Outer Banks are not really an area that you want to station ships along the shore for extended periods of time, right? So if you can take over a few key locations, including Hatteras or Roanoke Island, you basically choke off the inland ports like Plymouth and New Bern and um, um, Washington, okay? And so that's, this is part of their, their overall strategy of, of blockading southern ports. Hatteras is taken, and when the Union Army is encamped there, just, just a few days after they arrive, they notice this, this dinghy coming across Pamlico Sound. Rough weather, not ideal conditions, like conditions nobody would want to be in themselves. And when finally this boat arrives, it's this man named Ben. Only a first name that we know of, at least to my knowledge. And Ben had been enslaved on Roanoke Island, and he had basically risked his life to go across not only to get to Union Army lines, but he was sharing information about the Confederate defenses, sharing that there was about 2,500 Confederates camped on Roanoke Island, talking about the forts that they had, the number of guns that they had, their morale, a lot of critical information. A few days later, another younger man, 16-year-old Thomas Robinson, arrives on Hatteras, and he starts sharing information like that as well. He starts talking to General Ambrose Burnside, who is commanding the Union forces, and he starts talking about all of what I just mentioned, the conditions on the island and the troops and all of that, but almost more importantly, he knows how to navigate the sounds. It took a month for the Union ships to get through Hatteras Inlet because they didn't have any local knowledge. The, the, I think the success of the, the campaign that General Burnside <clears throat> conducted in eastern North Carolina. He was eventually able to capture not only Hatteras, but Roanoke Island and, and New Bern and other places. I think a lot of the success is due in, in large part to the advice and the, the information that he was getting from these local formerly enslaved. These were people that had worked on the water. These Don't think of these, these people as enslaved on a plantation. Eastern North Carolina, a lot of them were, were involved in um, as watermen, fishing, pilots. And so they had a certain, almost autonomy that some you wouldn't find in some places where, where enslaved were, were working. Okay, they had a certain amount of, I, don't, I don't, wouldn't want to use the word freedom, but a certain ability to move about on their own by definition when you're piloting a boat, you're going out and you're doing it on your own. So you're not constantly in view of your owner. And so that that grew a certain character, I would say. I think a character that a lot of us might associate with just people living on the Outer Banks in general, a tenacity, a, a self-reliance, an independence. And, and that was found within these, these people, these formerly enslaved that were assisting the Union Army. They had a vast knowledge and were able to share that. It's, it's interesting too that Thomas Robinson not only does he share information with General Burnside about how to get to Rona, where to navigate, but he says, I know the best landing location on the island for your troops. It's his old owner's house, okay, Ashby Harbor. So if you go down as if you're headed to, um, well, it's a turn just before going to CSI, okay, down there. And, and Ashby's Harbor is that location. It's where his previous owner lived, and I think it's a little ironic that this 16-year-old boy um, said, yes, this is the spot. It was a good landing, but I think there was more to it when he brought over 11,000 Union soldiers to his <laughs> former master's house. <laughs> the, the Battle of Roanoke Island was a fairly short battle. It was um, one day's landing where there was some skirmishing. The next day, the battle took place, and the, the thousands of Union soldiers, by that point, it was at least seven to 8,000 were on Roanoke Island, fairly quickly overwhelmed the 2,500 poorly armed Confederate defenders. That said, it wasn't without bloodshed, but it, it didn't last a long time. The, the Confederates end up retreating to the north side of Roanoke Island, where present day Ro, uh, Fort Raleigh exists, and, and that's where they ended up surrendering. Okay. Mm -hmm. The time, though, I wanna, wanna spend just a couple of minutes talking about what 
it was like at that time and some of the laws that defined what it was like at that time, particularly for either free or enslaved black in this area, in North Carolina. These were North Carolina laws that had been established for, for quite a while, but were in existence up until the Civil War. I think it's worth noting that individual cases would vary, but this is the overall framework that these people were living within. Okay, so I want to make that clear that not every individual experienced what I'm about to share, but it was the law of the land. One of them that I think stood out, this is um, the exact title would be the North Carolina Slaves and Free Persons of Color Act. Um, one of the, the sections in that talks about education and how you are forbidden to, to teach another person of color any sort of education other than symbols. You could teach them symbols. If you are caught and convicted, you get up to 39 lashes on your bare back. Um, one thing that also stood out to me was the fact that a free black wasn't, didn't have a lot of, of rights themselves. Um, one example could be that if, if a free black was deemed to be not positively contributing to society, i.e. not being productive, and this was, of course, in the eye of the beholder, their children could be taken from them despite them being free. Another thing is if you were a black that was emancipated, maybe your owner chooses to do that, maybe you purchase your freedom, maybe at the owner's death they've, they've included it in their will that you are, you are free, you have 90 days to leave the state. And if you don't, you're enslaved again. So fairly harsh, harsh rules. And um, this is the environment that these, these people are, are living with. Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 also, I think, would come into play. This is the, the law where, actually across the United States, it's talking about an enslaved that escapes to a northern state, a free state. The, the owners of that person are allowed to come and basically retrieve them, and that's, that's acceptable. Early in the Civil War, it's also the policy of the Union Army to to, to send back an enslaved that makes it to their lines early in the war. That's their policy. So anybody that, that makes it to the Union Army camp is sent back. Or the people who are coming after them are allowed to come and, and take them back to their plantation or wherever they come from. But this starts to change in 1861. One of the things that changes it is a single general named um, General Butler, Benjamin Butler, and he's stationed at Fort Monroe, so just north of us in Virginia. Okay, it's on the, the mouth of the James River, basically. <coughs> and that, that fort's held by the Union forces, even though it is in Virginia. And just after Butler arrives at his post there, it's in May, three days later, these three enslaved men who had been working for the, well, being forced to work for the Confederacy, made it across to the Union Army lines. And General Butler, he, he had some background as, as a lawyer, and he started thinking about this in a different way. He started thinking about it as, well, his term, contraband of war. This is where it starts. It's from Fortress Monroe in, the, in 1861. And the idea is that the Confederacy, as they would use a supply wagon or a cannon or any other supply, they're using this human labor to help their war effort. And so instead of being getting into emancipation or any of that, General Butler says, this is contraband of war, as I might take any other item you have to, to further your war effort, I'm going to take them. And so when the Confederate general comes across and asks for those three men's return, General Butler says no, and he keeps them. And this quickly spreads, and you start to see that term used more and more, contraband of war. I mean, honestly, today it's, it's sad when you think about it. It, it came to a, maybe a better place as the policy of the whole union government shifted from sending these people back to accepting them and eventually you get emancipation. But the idea that, that these people were, were classified as an animal might be is, is a hard truth. 
But what it does and why I share these things is because this is what sets up our Freedmen's Colony on Roanoke Island. Without these, this wouldn't have been possible because when the Union Army does capture Roanoke in February of 1862, February 8th, so not that long ago, right? It was the anniversary, 161st anniversary. This, all of these things have taken place. And so now when an enslaved makes it to Union lines, they are not sent back. They are allowed to stay. In fact, when General Burnside captures Roanoke Island, he, he finds there's about 200 enslaved black men that had been working on the Confederate fortifications. He gives them a choice. They have three options. They can take a one-way trip to a northern state of their choice. They can remain on the island, or they can return to where they had come from. And most of these people had been brought from other parts of North Carolina uh, from different plantations. So parts of South Carolina too, a little bit. And um, I think many in the Union Army might have been a little bit surprised at first. Maybe you are surprised at first to know that over 170 of them chose to return to where they had come from. Uh, but what that is, is they're going back for their families. They're not intending to stay in that location. They're going back to, to get their families, their friends, the people that, that they were close to, the people they've basically been taken away from. And they spread the word that if you can make it to Roanoke Island, you can get your freedom. And so this, this changes the, um, the outcome, I guess, of Roanoke Island during the Civil War because people start making their way to the place and hundreds start making their way here. Um, I, almost every day when I drop off my, my kid at daycare, I, I drive on California Street and for a little while, I didn't really think much of it, but then you, you step back and you're like, why, why is it California Street? And um, the, the tradition is that enslaved communities would, would talk about going to California as a place of freedom and hope. And it didn't matter that Roanoke Island was the opposite direction of actual California. This was a place where they could hopefully find hope and, and freedom. And so they called it their house. And today, it's a place where a lot of the descendants of the Freedmen's Colony still live, in that area. As far as getting to the island, and I know this map might be a little hard to see for, for those listening in, and, um, and maybe even for those of us in the room, it's, it's a map from 1861 to 64. This is the coast of North Carolina and Virginia. <clears throat> you have <clears throat> uh, Roanoke Island would be right here. So on the, the right side, about a third of the way up, right on the right side. Cape Hatteras would be down at this point. You have Virginia and North Carolina state line just over halfway up the map. And I show this because one of the things that, that we have learned fairly recently is we've, we've understood better how people were arriving on Roanoke Island. This, this site, Fort Raleigh, is part of the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. That's sites all across the country, both national parks and others, that are involved in some way in this, this movement leading up to and during the Civil War of, of taking an enslaved person to freedom, right? And so we, I think a lot of times we will think of the Underground Railroad as groups of people or individuals making their way slowly to a place where they can gain their freedom. And that's part of the story of the Freedmen's Colony of Roanoke Island, but it's not all of it. I would say it's maybe a third of the people traveling to, to free, the Freedmen's Colony arrived in that way. A um, couple of, of personal accounts that we have. One is from a, um, a person that was Vincent Collier, and he was with the Union Army when they, they took over Roanoke Island. Um, he ends up being the first person in charge of the Freedmen's Colony for a short time before somebody else takes over. And, and he's talking about how just after they arrive, a party of 15 or 20 of these loyal blacks, men, women, and children, arrive on a dinghy in front of the general's headquarters, General Burnside, where my tent was located. They came from up the Chawan River 
and as they were passing, they had been shot at by their rebel masters from the banks of the river, but escaped uninjured. They were a happy party, rejoicing at their escape from slavery and danger, and at the hearty welcome <coughs> which was at once extended to them by the officers and men of the New England regiments, which chiefly made up the corps under General Burnside's command. It rained hard that night, and shelter being rather scarce on the island, I gave up my tent to the women and children and found quarters for myself with a neighbor. So one, one account of these people arriving, and you can imagine that feeling of somebody who's been enslaved their entire life and has always had the, the threat of perhaps their children at any time being able to be taken away from them. You, 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 I, I can't even imagine what it would have been like to step on to a place where you feel like that no longer is the case for you. There was a, an account of an enslaved who um, slipped 24 other enslaved onto his schooner, his master's schooner in Columbia, and sailed them down Albemarle Sound. So we're, we're talking down Albemarle Sound here to Roanoke Island once the Union Army captured it. Okay. Um, we, we, if I didn't mention it already, we've been uncovering a lot of, of information fairly recently. In fact, one account that I'll share later was passed to me yesterday by, by somebody as park staff. Um, they, they just discovered it. So this is an ongoing process, and what I'm sharing with you is kind of an overview of the colony, but also some of this more recent research that we've been able to, to find, um, or at least connect to our colony here. Um, this personal account is from a Miss Marie Watkins, and she was brought to Roanoke Island as a, as a young, young girl. And the account comes from a newspaper, the Brooklyn Daily, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, um, from 1949. And at that point, she's 92 years old. Okay. But she, she remembers that the rebels, quote, the, the rebels broke a stick over my mother's back. And when she tried to escape with us at the end of the Civil War, we, we children fell across her body, weeping. But she managed to get away anyhow. Miss Watkins recalled pulling my sister and me after her through the tall grass. And when we finally reached shelter, I remember she collapsed. And they told us that my mother was dead. But she didn't die. And when the dawn came, broken and beaten though she was, my mother rose up from her bed. And niece, Jackson, which was this mother's, uh, person's mother, destination was Roanoke Island, since written, up, since written up in the history books as a place where free blacks tried to build a community on their own land the federal government had given them, which we'll get to. It's not entirely true. Um, but an alarm had gone off. Uh, the alarm had gone out for her. They said that she was inciting the colored people with her folklore and songs. And East Jackson and her children were captured and put aboard a boat to be returned to Elizabeth City and their master. But then she goes on, my mother didn't give up that easily. She ripped the ruffling from her white petticoat and she went to the bow of the boat and kept waving it whenever she had a chance. And sure enough, a Union gunboat saw the distress signal. It hoped to and just so it's like one would expect in a movie, the captain rescued Anise Jackson and her daughters. The gunboat took them to Roanoke Island, where Miss Jackson's parents already had gone. And for two years, Marie and her sister lived with her grandparents. At first, like the other children, they slept on the ground on quilts until log cabins were built on the island. And it's just, it's one of a handful of, of accounts from people that were involved with the community that we've been able to, to find, um, accounts that we, we were not aware of before, and the, the reference material that we typically would go to didn't have either. Some of this I, I would take a little bit with a grain of salt as far as like the, the dates and things, because this person was 92 years old, and um, by, by her own account, she she's, says I might be a little bit fuzzy. So when she's talking about the end of the Civil War, the escape happening, um, it doesn't necessarily coincide with when the cabins would have been built in the Freedmen's Colony. So, uh, you know, a little bit unsure on, on that. But this person was a part of the Freedmen's Colony for a couple of years, it sounds like. So that's how some people came, and that's early on. And, and because of that, because hundreds of, of these formerly enslaved start arriving on the north end of Roanoke Island, the, the U.S. Army realizes that something has to be done. It wasn't a planned thing. It was by necessity that they realized to prevent diseases from spreading, they need to make something happen here. Okay? And they start, um, they, they first make a general order in the Army that a, um, 
obviously I don't remember the guy's rank, but he's a Union soldier, is in charge of, of laying out a community on the north side of Berlin. Um, that's not the only way, though, that, that people found their way to Roanoke Island and the Freedmen's Colony. Another big source of, of the population would have been from General Edward Wilde's march through Virginia and parts of eastern North Carolina. And, and this is, <laughs> if anybody's ever read about um, Sherman's march through the South, you could think of it in that way on a smaller scale. It's done with USCTs or US colored troops, but it's, it's the same sort of campaign where they're trying to stamp out guerrilla warfare. They also are fairly harsh with the destruction of, of farms and property. And um, they're also taking <coughs> any enslaved and freeing them. But it's, I don't know if it's forced, but it's strongly suggested and implied that any men are going to join the Union Army. But they get a promise. They get a promise that their family will be sent to Roanoke Island. They'll be provided for, given a house, given rations and supplies to, to take care of themselves. Okay. And so that's, that's where a large chunk of, of people arrive. At one account, it talks about nine boatloads. And I'm not, I don't think we're talking uh, rowboats. I think we're talking larger, like small steamers and things like that. Nine boatloads arrive on Roanoke Island with these people. The last... I guess large influx that we've been able to identify so far is when the, the city of Plymouth falls in 1864. So the Union Army captured it, the Confederates retake it. And there's almost a thousand, a little over a thousand refugees, I would call them at this point, who are, are, are hastily taken out of Plymouth and arrive on Roanoke Island. These people are traumatized. These people are, are not in any state to try to support themselves. And I would say that this has something to do with the, not only the dynamic of the Freedmen's Colony, but also potentially the, the ultimate downfall of the Freedmen's Colony. This, this community only lasted for four years on Roanoke Island, officially from 1863 until 1867. Unofficially, it was happening. There were people living on the north end of Roanoke Island in 1862, just after the Union Army captured Roanoke. So at most, you could say maybe five years. Okay. So the, the colony, where was it? We don't know. It's an easy answer. Okay, we don't know. But this is a really, I would say, solid guess that we've been able to come up with recently. This is based off of written documentation that we have from people that were involved in the Freedmen's Colony. And to give you a reference, you have Shallow Bag Bay down here on the lower right-hand side of this image. So this is the north side of Roanoke Island. Excuse me. Landmarks that people might be able to, would be familiar with, would be the airport, almost in the center, just, just below the center of this photo. You can follow 64 up and along and it goes across to the Vance Harbor Bridge. And these lines, think of these as the main streets that are running not quite north to south, but you get the idea. I guess it would actually be northwest to southeast. And then there would be side streets connecting them all the way along. So imagine a grid pattern, okay? These streets were named like Ro uh, Roanoke, uh, Burnside was one of them, Lincoln was another. And it's a really tough thing to try to figure out where exactly this colony existed. One, because structures don't remain. We, we don't have a physical structure that was from the Freedmen's Colony itself, or, or the homes, I should say. There's a couple of structures that are from the period. Um, we have some really elaborate plans that were sub sent to mm -hmm offices in Washington, D.C. by a guy named Horace James, who becomes the superintendent of Roanoke and other Freedmen's <coughs> colonies and camps. But he was also, he liked to boast a little bit, and, and we don't really know whether his plan ever came to fruition. We don't know if everything was completed that he says was completed. Um, but this is, this is a pretty good guess, we think. And, and what it does is it shows us that a large part of Roanoke Island is once where this community existed. And one thing that I wouldn't have known as of four months ago 
or anyone at the park would have known is how far to the north it likely extended. It goes into present day Fort Rollin. In fact, it goes almost right up to the parking lot by the Elizabethan Gardens, if anyone's familiar with that. Now, that would have been the outskirts, that would have been the fringes of, of the town, likely. Uh, we know that the heart of the community was closer to the airport, more on the south side here. We also know that there was a, a real differentiation between the north and the south side. You could think of the north side as a really poor, poorly maintained Ellis Island, where, where people who are arriving, whether it be the individual families like I've talked about, whether it be the, the, um, the people that were coming, the families of the, the colored soldiers that were being brought here, whether it be the people arriving from Plymouth, the fall of Plymouth, they all start towards the north side. Camp Foster was a Union uh, camp that was located up in that area, and they, they called it Camp Foster. Um, it was really poor conditions. A lot of the buildings that they had were, were insignificant. They were too small. They had been built with green lumber, and so as that lumber dried, they were very drafty. Um, the conditions were, were quite terrible, to be honest with you. And those conditions were actually probably worse than what the people had experienced while, while being enslaved. Now, the, the goal was that the people would leave this area and come down into more of the community proper. Eventually, there was, there was 591 cabins built. Um, there was multiple schoolhouses. There was at least two churches that were constructed in this community. There was a sawmill that was operating by Pork Point, so that's down lower side, basically the, the bottom center of this image. So just south of the airport. Exact location is, is unknown, but, but closer to Pork Point where this the sawmill was, was running <coughs> and, um, and producing boards. Um, one, one thing that I think has been really fascinating is that Fort Raleigh, I feel like, just is, is a piece of the overall story of, of what these people's lives were like. I think that if you were to travel to the east and you go to Somerset Plantation, you would see what, where a lot of these people started. In mm. fact, we do know now that two individuals, at least, came directly from Somerset Place to the Roanoke uh, Freedmen's Colony. We wonder if one of them, or maybe both, had knowledge in sawmill operations because there was one at Somerset Place. And this would have been a, a very skilled job. Not anybody could have just stepped into that role. And we, we haven't been able to prove it, but we're, we're curious to, to find out whether maybe one of those people was the person for at least a time operating the sawmill during the, the Freedmen's Colony. Hopefully we find that out at some point. But so trying to connect with these other sites, uh, we know that at the end of the Freedmen's Colony, some of these people were traveling to the north. And if anybody is familiar with the J Jarvisburg School, we've been able to, to find an account from one of the <coughs> Um, teachers in the Freedmen's Colony that says at the, the dissolution of this community, some of the free people were traveling to, well, she calls it Rollsburg, but it's, it's um, um, Jarvis, no, sorry, Powell's Point. She calls it Rowell's Point. Um, and and they're starting a the school there. And we know that the Jarvisburg School opens in 1868, a year after the Freedmen's Colony disbanded. And the fact that education was such a major part of this community and the focus of this community, to us it seems, well, it, it, we expected that the, there would have been a connection with Jarvisburg School, but we've been able to, to prove that, uh, which has been pretty interesting too. Let's see. Sure. Where, you mentioned a Somerset place or plant. Where is that? <clears throat> uh, so if you're headed to Columbia, it's it's south of there. Uh, no, Lake it's Phelps. West, west. Huh? It's west of Columbia. Did I? It's north of 64. Right. <clears throat> did, did, what did I say? Did I mess it up? It's south. You go to Columbia and keep going to Creswell. Mm -hmm. Isn't it closer to Lake Phelps? Sort of. yeah, take his word for it because, <laughs> yeah, but, but it's, it's, I guess what I, what I should have said is in the direction, travel as if you're going to Columbia, but it's out yeah. to the west of us. Yeah, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, they have tours. It's a really fascinating it place. Is. Yeah, yeah. And lots of information. That's where Dot Redford did all her research. I mean, there's, there's tons and tons of there is. knowledge and information titles and so forth. Yes. You know, a lot of times I think it's, it's as I said before, maybe connecting the information um, that maybe we haven't seen before. Yeah. Can I ask, um, are you implying or that most people that arrived arrived at the north end then? What we see is that most people, as they were coming to Roanoke Island, at least would start there. Many would then quickly move to the south side, but the, the, they wouldn't necessarily arrive on the shore at that location. Most of the landings actually took place closer to, to Port Point. They would be brought up there as like a, I guess a holding place almost, um, and <clears> then <throat> be assigned a, a plot of land to build a, a home on and a small garden. Absolutely none of those buildings that were built are, there's nothing left. The, the only building that, <laughs> that, that yeah, so a couple of homes <laughs> that are on the island are, were around during the Civil War, but they weren't, they weren't necessarily part of the Freedmen's Colony, they would have already been there. Um, there's also a, a structure that is, I, I think a shed currently, that was the smallpox hospital that still survives. But that's just, a, a, at this point, somebody's personal. So why is there a lack of um, real artifacts? I mean, it's only 160 years ago, so why is there a lack of artifacts that you know, be definitive about some of these things? I mean, it doesn't seem that long ago. It, it doesn't, does it? Um, the average American lifespan was like 79 point something years. It's basically two of those. Yeah, it's not that long. I think that the lack of artifacts, physical objects, could be for, from two things. One is that when this community, and I, and I haven't really talked much about when the community ended yet, but when it did, many buildings were sold off, many buildings were destroyed, and anything that remained, let's face it, this area is known for its resourcefulness, and those people who live here are known for resourcefulness. They're going to use things that are left behind. You know, it's, it's we, we, we don't know for sure, but you start to notice uh, an increase in the number of bricks used in construction after this, and anyone would suspect that it's because all the chimneys and the bricks that were used for the foundation of the sawmill are being repurposed mm -hmm. and used by people living here. Mm -hmm. So that's part of it, okay, where, where these things are just not left in place. But then also part of it, I, I would say, is that there hasn't been a lot of archaeological work done. Mm -hmm. Actually looking? Right, yeah, I, a little bit, limited, um, but not a lot. And, and um, why? I, <laughs> that's a question I think I'll, I'll leave a little bit open-ended, but part of it is that there's a lot that is built on this area now. Mm -hmm. it, isn't it also true that the, the land that the colony was being built on was land that had been taken away from owners? Absolutely. And, and I'm sure you'll get to it eventually, they get it back, they get so it they're going to wipe out whatever was there and rebuild their own life. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. They're going to wipe it out. Yeah. You know, imagine living here, um, well, as many of you, you can, right? But then you have one force arrive who takes not a lot of heed of you, and then you have another large force arrive, and you're just kind of at the will of these, these troops that are stationed on the island. And then this community gets built on your land, yeah, it's, um, you know, local families, many did not own slaves, some, a few did, um, but many were just basically caught up in this, everything going on around them, and so if, if you have a structure left behind on your, your property, you're probably going to reuse it or take it down and use it for something else. You you have your land probably completely um, logged by that point, so you, you have limited resources yourself, and you're going to reuse it. Yeah. Um, Josh, yeah. Um, for a new title question, you can't get to the other two points. Oh, that's right. You said that. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but that's I think Trisha's been typing the question. Okay. 
Yeah, I apologize for that. For, for any of those Where does the little, location of the lost colony play in terms of your map? Where is that on your map now? Okay, yeah, so the question was, where's the lost colony play in relation to the map? And the play is going to be at the, the very top of this map. Uh, we've got the Elizabethan right. Gardens oh, parking yeah. lot right here. This oh. is the Elizabethan Gardens, and so the play is, is right there. So if you're looking at home, it's basically the, the top um, left side, probably about a quarter of the way from the left corner, where the Lost Colony play is, and, and where the park exists. Yeah. So when they were looking for artifacts for the Lost Colony, did they find anything from the Freemans? No, we, we haven't found anything from the Freedmen's Colony specifically while doing excavations around the earthen mounds in the theater area. We have found Civil War artifacts at times, but we also know that there was a, a Civil War regiment um, camped in what is now the, the parking lot of, of the park and the theater. So we certainly find that era artifact, but nothing that we would tie directly to the community. Yeah. Okay. I think a couple of things I just wanted to highlight with the Freedmen's Colony. One is the role that, that um, education played in the community. And, and that, was a, that was known from the, right from the start. We don't know much about her, but a woman named Martha Culling was the first teacher on the island. She, she was black. We don't know where she found her education, which was a risky thing at that time. I mean, that was, you, you get punished for that. Um, but she, she opens the first school and then later starts working for the, the um, National Freedmen's Relief Association, one of the two, primarily two groups that were running missionary schools in the Freedmen's community. Um, so education was huge. And, and that was known by the people when they came across because they knew that education would be a way to, to further themselves, to better themselves, to be able to, to go somewhere, basically. And, um, and that was also supported by the AMA, so American Missionary Association, and the, the other one I just mentioned. They brought missionary teachers from the north in, and, and they were responsible for a lot of the schools, operating a lot of the schools that were in the Freedmen's Colony. And there were, like I said before, I think it was at least five, possibly more, um, and um, over 16 teachers spent at least some time on Roanoke Island. So that's a big part of the community. Um, industry, I think, is a big part of the community with the sawmill. They did try some, some fishing operations which weren't very successful. For a short time, they tried a small um, kind of domestic operation where they, they were producing household type items as a way for an education for the women, but also a way to provide an income for themselves as well. It wasn't real successful because it kind of happened towards the end of the community. And then the other thing that I think is a, a big part of it, actually two things, one is religion. Um, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't skip over that. Uh, we don't, as I mentioned before, we don't have images of this, but this is a piece of art created by one of our park volunteers, just a, a watercolor. And it's more symbolic. We don't know what the structures looked like exp uh, explicitly, but this is just symbolic with Roanoke Island and a, a church. Um, we do have an account. <coughs> And this is from Vincent Collier as well. He says, on Roanoke Island, the blacks, for want of a church, had constructed a spacious bower, cutting down long, straight pine trees and placing them parallel lengthwise for seats, with space enough between their knees, constructing a rude pulpit out of the discarded quartermaster's boxes and overreaching the hole with a thick covering of pine branches. So um, there you go, the description of the first church built on Roanoke Island. And this would have been within the first couple of days or, or possibly weeks after the, the battle in, in February of 1862 um, that he's writing this. It says spring of 1862. That's when this report is coming out. Um, the other thing that, that was really defined the Freedmen's Colony was the U.S. color troops, and once they were able to be recruited, that really changed the dynamic of the colony. Most of the men, we know at least 139 <coughs> men were recruited specifically from the Freedmen's Colony, possibly more. Um, and, and so most of the people that remained on the island were, were the families of those men uh, or, or people that were elderly and children. We have one particular um, <coughs> person named uh, Spencer Gallup, who was in the 36th, it was the 35th, 36th, and 37th U.S. Colored Troops that were recruited from this area and, and a few members from Roanoke Island for each 
mostly in the 36, though. Um, I believe the 36 was also the, the regiment that Richard Etheridge was a part of, and Richard Etheridge being a more well-known name in this area. Um, he is living on Roanoke Island, joins the Union Army, later becomes the keeper at, um, at Pete Island. Uh, yeah, um, so. But Spencer Gallup, um, private, when he's, he says he's 19, by his best estimate, he's 19 when he enlists. Um, he, he's there between 1863, in, in the Army between 1863 and 1866. Uh, so a three-year time frame, which is, is common. Um, he says, quote, I belonged to a man by the name of Hodges Gallup at Currituck before the war and worked on a farm. He says, I cut wood and helped build the forts for the Yankees as a laborer on Roanoke Island. Uh, he enlisted in June of 1863. Uh, he was part of the U.S. Colored Troops, and um, Company A and K of the 36th U.S. Colored Troops were the first Union infantry to enter Richmond in April of 1865. They didn't make it far, but they made it just far enough that they could say they did it, and then they let the cavalry go past, which was common practice, that they would, they would enter first. So they, they just wanted to get in there to say they were the first ones in. Um, but the, the soldiers and their recruitment from Roanoke and the fact that a lot of the families of recruits were sent to Roanoke was a, a, played a big part in the community. This, this colony, did not last long. I mentioned that already. Four years officially, and by 1867, it's it's over. Um, I want to be honest that the conditions were not great at times. So, sometimes they were. So there's a variety of stories that you can pick out any one of them if you'd like to. And some individuals are very successful, and, and a lot of that maybe is due to the Freedmen's Colony. But there were also things going on that um, that, that were not great. Um, this is a letter written by Richard Etheridge and William Benson. And it says, General, we the soldiers of the 36th Colored Regiment humbly petition you to alter the affairs at Roanoke Island. We have served in the US Army faithfully and done our duty to our country for which we thank God that we had the opportunity, but at the same time our families are suffering on Roanoke Island. When we enlisted in the service, we were promised that our wives and families should receive rations from the government. The rations for our wives and families have been, and are now cut down to, one half the regular ration. Consequently, three or four days out of every 10 days, they have nothing to eat. At the same time, our rations are stolen from the ration house by Mr. Streeter, the assistant superintendent of the island, and others, and sold while our families are suffering for something to eat. That, that's true, that happened. Um, Mr. Streeter, the assistant superintendent of Blacks, on Roanoke Island is a, a copperhead, and he says that he's no part of an abolitionist. Takes no care of colored people and has no sympathy for the colored people. The man who kicks our wives and children out of the ration house or commissary, he takes no notice of their actual sufferings and sells the rations and allows them to be sold. He goes on to, to talk about other concerns that they have, and this is one of several letters sent to General Howard, who is um, at that point in charge of the, the Freedmen's Affairs, okay? Um, the, the colony, it's really, it's almost doomed from the start because as we've talked about briefly, this was land that was owned by people, people that had lived here for a long time already, and the Union Army arrives and basically confiscates land. They're, they're confiscating it saying that it's, it's rebel land, but a lot of the locals were not on one side or the other. They, they were here, this was their home, they were living here. They didn't really take an active part in the war for the Confederacy or for the Union. A few did, but not a lot. And, and so this land is, is used. The people that are put on it, all of the correspondence talks about it being this long-term settlement. Horace James talks about it being, um, he, he relates it to the, the English attempt a couple hundred years before, but that this one's going to be better for, and he goes on and lists the reasons. He's envisioning, in the beginning, a long-term settlement that these people stay on. And he thinks that the land issue will just get sorted out later on. He expects that the people will be willing to sell, but they're not. And so eventually, as, as time goes on, this becomes more and more clear. And once the war ends, there's a few things that, that happen that make it more possible, but the, the previous landowners are petitioning for their land back. 
which they own and they can show deed for. And so it, it, it puts both parties in this tough situation. And to just give you a, a, a better sense of the overall, um, the overall um, challenge, I guess, this posed, was at that time there was a little over 18 million people living in the North. There was about 5.5 million whites in the Confederate States. And there was over 3.5 million blacks in the Confederate States, either enslaved, mostly enslaved. Um, and so you think about five and a half million and three and a half million, and you're trying to take people who had nothing, literally the ability to control, control their own actions, and you're trying to now put them into an area with almost the same number of people. I don't know exactly what the population of Roanoke Island is, but you can imagine trying to, to suddenly plant two-thirds of Roanoke's population now onto the island and not expect trouble to come up from it. 600 people. 600 people? Like 600, about 180 uh, slaves brought to the uh, in 1860. Oh, in 1860. Yeah, I guess I meant like today. I don't know if, what the population is, but imagine trying to take two-thirds of that and put it in. Um, it, it's... The, the land wasn't there for the Freedmen's Colony. It was never purchased. And these, these people start petitioning and start eventually are successful with their petitions and they start getting their land back. Um, these people were getting their land back after it, it, for the most part, had been cleared. And so I want to recognize that for a lot of those individuals, this was a really tough time as well because they have little left for themselves at the end of the war. Clearly for the people that originally had been promised that land, but then were forced off. They were forced off mainly through the reduction of rations, as this letter stated, to the point where they just couldn't stay anymore for the most of them. Obviously, they're in a tough spot trying to make that now go find a job and, and a place to live. Um, there's always, there's other, other side too, though, where we have a number of families who, they had lived here for their whole lives. They were part of the Freedmen's Colony, but this is what they knew, this was their home as well, and they end up purchasing land from one of the landowners, I believe Doe was, was the name, and, um, and they, they live here and their descendants live here to this day. And so we, we have a variety of, of individual stories, but generally speaking, the vast majority of these people, which the height of it was 3,500, at least 3,500 people living in the Freedmen's Colony, most of them ended up going back to parts of Eastern North Carolina where they once had been from. Yeah. Was there any violence associated with this uh, struggle between the, with the land? So to my knowledge, I, I, don't, I don't have, a, oh sorry, and the question was, was there any violence associated with this, this um, time where, where the land is being transferred? And I don't have any specific accounts of, of violence directly to an individual. I, I am aware that some of the Freedmen's Colony buildings were burnt by a landowner, probably in spite because they had had a long um, battle trying to get, get their land back. And, and so there was nobody in the, the buildings, but they did destroy those. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm not aware of that. I, the only act of violence that I'm aware of is one member of the Freedmen's Colony who went inland and tried to find a job was, was shot and, and killed. Um, but that's just a kind of an isolated you know, one reference and um, generally wouldn't have been really easy for these people. But like I said before, you have a variety of, of individual stories, some very successful, some, some not so much. A yeah. um, few key points that we've been able to, uh, able to, to learn is, um, I don't know if I can find it here, discovery of two widow pensions from members of the 37th U.S. Colored Troops. So we have, we have those, we've been able to find that, which is interesting. First person account of a colonist from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, which I shared with you. A reliable, more reliable map, I would argue, of the Freedmen's Colony, which I've, I've shared with you, with the location of it, based on information that's available now. Been able to, to um, transcribe over 150 pages of orders, reports, and letters concerning the Freedmen's Colony from the National Archives and 80 pages have been transcribed from
from Reverend Forrest James's paper. And I didn't mention him much, but he was the, the superintendent of, in charge for most of the time of the Freedmen's Colony. Um, established a connection for sure with the Jarvisburg School and, um, and also Somerset Place, which is, uh, I think, a, a neat connection. And um, we started a, a database of colonists' names for future genealogical research. And, and this is an ongoing project. If anybody has information or, or thinks of someone who might have information, you know, wouldn't it be, be neat to, to have some first-hand accounts of some of the locals who were on the island and saw this happening? Uh, that, would be, that would be amazing to be able to get that. Um, contact the park, I guess, if, if you know of anyone. We, we have zero images of the Freedmen's Colony. I don't know, it's probably a wild chance, but is, is there one out there and someone's at it? I, I'm not sure. Or even of Roanoke Island in the 1860s. The, be, the closest we know of is a Union warship that was off the coast of Roanoke, and so actually you see um, Man's Harbor, that shoreline, you don't see Roanoke shoreline in that photo. Um, briefly, I know I'm getting close on time here, briefly I just wanted to mention as well that we, we have this information, but there's there's some a purpose that we, we want to be able to share this. We want to be able to um, better have people better understand this history. Um, this is a powerful story, as is the other history sh at, at the park site. Um, and we have a small visitor center where we can't we can't say a whole lot. So we've actually we've identified one of the trails in the park. There's a one and a quarter mile long path that goes from our visitor center out to the, the west side of the island, the Croatan Sound. It's called the Freedom Trail. And we thought it would be a really neat opportunity to create more of an outdoor exhibit because it's in the area where the colony once stood. We've learned that now. And so we're, we're working on both signage, but also maybe silhouettes, things, things that'll help capture that history and share that story with people. And uh, it's a project that's been funded through grants from the National, um, the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom and the National Park Foundation have, have given us money for this and then also Outer Banks Forever, a local entity which is the philanthropic partner for the national parks has, has given us money as well. So um, we're excited for this. Um, by the end of this year, by December, we should have things installed and in place and probably next spring we'd be doing more of a, an official um, unveiling. But it's a lot of, lot of work going on and so that's a lot of the, the impetus behind this research but I've been excited to, to be able to, to share that with you. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. We do have a question from a Zoomer. Sure. Do you think any of the Freedmen's Colony residents moved later to Durant Island? Okay, do, do I think if any of the Freedmen's Colony <coughs> members moved to Durant Island? To my knowledge, we don't have any accounts specifically referencing Durant Island, no. Not impossible. There's 3,500 people. Most of them leave, but I, we don't have a specific reference. Where, where is Durant? I don't know, but I've never heard of it either. Uh, where, where is Durant? Durant Island is a little island right <coughs> north of East Lake. It's okay. It's a little there, island west, west of Roanoke Island. West of Roanoke Island. Yeah. Yeah. Off the mainland, just just on the other side of, of the sound. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Is there any estimation through genealogy about how many descendants of Freedom Colony actually still live on Rock Island? Because genealogy is so advanced now. Mm -hmm. Do you have any estimate, any real count in terms of descendants that still live on Rock Island in the community? You know, that's that's probably a number. And then the question was is how many descendants of the Freedmen's Colony still live on Roanoke Island and whether uh, Ancestry.com and other things might be able to tell us that. I, I would bet that's a number somebody would know, but I'm not that person. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I certainly am aware of several individuals that actually the park works with pretty regularly that are, but I, I, I don't have an overall number for you. Would you guess it's a very small number? Well, if, if I remember correctly, it was 11, 11 families that stayed on Roanoke Island and purchased property, if I remember correctly, it's 11. And, um, you know, from that, I'm not sure what we, what we get because people, of course, are probably moving away and, and some are staying, but um, okay. yeah, Thank you. that's as close as I can get. You can track some of the names that are still Ashby's, uh, Ashby's and uh, others, and, and those family names still live in, in Bowser's and those. Oh, those absolutely. Ones. Yeah, Tilly and Bowser. And Bowser. Yeah. Yeah. that are descended from yeah. the courted residents. 
So the Collins, Collins would be another Collins one. Collins would be another one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Barry. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're being videoed. Are we going to be able to have them on the TV channel so other people can see your talk? Uh, that's and a great question. Um, I, I would have to defer to, to Jess Barnes, the director of the Out of Banks Forever group. I, I don't know where, where this video will end up, um, but, but perhaps it's put online. Yeah, we'll have it on our YouTube channel. So if you go to obxforever.org, we've got our link there. So we'll have it up by next week. Thank you. You're doing a wonderful job. Thank you. Did you have a question? Yeah. Nick, is, is there... I believe I, I know of a thing that may be an artifact left over from. Okay. Who can I talk? Who should I talk to? to yeah. So the question is, you or, may be aware of an artifact that could be left over from this time frame that we've talked about today, and the best person would be probably Jamie Lanier, who is the historian for the, the national parks in this area. Jamie Lanier. Jamie Lanier, and and if you want, I can I can put you in contact with her. Um, yeah, so she's the historian for, for Hatteras, for Wright Brothers, and Fort Raleigh, but she's in charge of the, the archive um, that's on site at Fort Raleigh. Yeah. Yes? So yeah, the superintendent um, and was the main superintendent, was he the one that was stealing things and selling her? That was, a, that was an assistant, assistant. Paul and Streeter, yeah. So the government, U.S. government sends these guys down to administer this place, rules and regulations, laws, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, did the freedmen actually try to form some sort of government, do you know, at any point? Yes, good question. So did the freedmen ever at any point try to, to form their own government? And at one point, there were 15 members of the freedmen's colony that were assigned as, I think they called them counselors, and, and that was an attempt at a self-governing body. Wasn't successful, and I wouldn't put it on the, the backs of those 15. It was more that they didn't have any power because you need, you need the community's respect, first of all. And a lot of these people were coming in so recently, these large influxes of, of people into the colony, that it was hard to ever establish that sense of community. I mean, in, in smaller pockets you could, but ex exclusively throughout the whole thing, it was harder. And then part of it, too, is that you are at the whim of the U.S. Army. And, and so you don't have ultimate authority to say what goes on. Right. The, an example would be when the, um, the army comes in and says to the, the teachers in the schools, we're using this building, they, they had to pack up and leave. At times their beds were taken away from them uh, because they were, were requisitioned for, for some other purpose. And, and so that's the type of, of environment that was here at the time, and so it was nearly impossible for that government to be successful. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.